I was talking with John just before we started here, and was just mentioning that this, uh, that, that I really, you know, as a pastor and as a Bible school teacher and whatever, I assume that everybody is checking everything out in the Word. You should be doing that. <clears throat> but this, this particular area that I'm about to begin, I think it's real important that you do that because I, I believe that um, it's sort of an area that people get wrong, and it's basic. I mean, it's basic. <clears throat> and um, and I, I'll also say this, that <clears throat> even though uh, I stand behind the podium and I teach, and I obviously share a lot from the scriptures, my personal goal in life is not... Um, to be a teacher, to instruct you. My goal <clears throat> is that together we really learn the Lord and we learn him by his heart, not by theology. And I, that's my desire and <clears throat> in my searching of the scriptures and my personal time that I spend in the word, I'm looking for Jesus. I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, and nobody said anything or whatever, but I just want to reiterate to you that um, <clears throat> where I come from on all this, because I, I mean, it's how I ended up in the ministry and everything, because I was just after the Lord, not because I was trying to be a minister. And, uh, <clears throat> and, I, and I believe that uh, <clears throat> to really know the Lord you're going to have to get past the ink on white paper and have the Holy Spirit show you what, what he's saying and why he's saying it and where it's coming from, from his point of view. I mean, true communication really is to try to listen to somebody else from their point of view, you know, and not just you say whatever you think and everything, and okay, now we're communicating, you know, and you're going, okay. <clears throat> and we laugh, but we have people right here in this fellowship that still do stuff like that, and, and we don't want to do that. We want to, you know, <clears throat> we want to know one another, not after the flesh, but after the heart and after the Lord, but we particularly want to know the Lord <clears throat> in a real way and based on who he is. And therefore, Jesus said, if you knew me, you'd know the doctrine. What? If you knew me, you'd know my doctrine, you know. And in knowing him, then it's, it explains what he's saying. But if you don't know what he how he is, you can misinterpret his doctrine. <clears throat> and uh, again, personally, from my perspective, not wanting to be off, whether, you know, as a leader, I don't want to lead people astray, but more than that, I don't ever want to be off from the Lord, you know. I don't want to think something of him that is not true of him or, or whatever. <clears throat> and the only way I've found that is the safest path to that is to keep my heart where I'm pursuing a him, not an it or something. So, <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> this area that I want to talk about, and we're only going to do the one hour this time, so sorry, Doug, and love you, brother, and <clears throat> Karen, and Karen and Sharon. And we love you guys, <clears throat> and we're glad that... You know, and really, that's what we want around this fellowship: more caring and sharing. I mean, Karen and Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, did you turn to Philippians two? Yes. All right. Instead of rereading the whole thing, verses five through eight have to do with the cross. Verses 9 and 11 have to do with the resurrection, <clears throat> the exaltation. And, um, <clears throat> and I, want you to, I want you to consider what I'm going to share. What I'm going to share is going to be in light of what is the most important thing, the death of Christ or the resurrection of Christ. And you would think this is real plain and real clear to most people. <clears throat> 
And my, and my title for this would be, is, is resurrection the point? Is resurrection the point? Okay. <clears throat> and, um, and I really, I'm asking you to try to take this beyond the classroom, to, to meditate on, carry it with you, and, and ask the Holy Spirit to show you if it's true, because if it is what we're, our conclusions are going to be, <clears throat> you need to have those from the Lord not because Randy taught them or New Creation teaches it or that sort of thing. <clears throat> All right. So um, I'm just, because I've got so much to cover, I'm just going to try to do my best to read a little bit here. <clears throat> In God's eyes, which is the greatest, death or resurrection? <clears throat> now, I'll even give you a few minutes to think about that because I'll state some reasons why one seems to be more chosen than the other. But the question isn't what appeals to us. The question is what, what of the two appeals to God? <clears throat> uh, certainly in the eyes of many believers, they would say that the resurrection is the greater of the two. Makes sense, right? Doesn't it? I mean... I said, why? It would seem greater because the most benefits come to us by means of that event. All right, that should send up a red flag right there. The most benefits to us, therefore, we're in this for the benefits and not to just be with Jesus. So that if Jesus walks over to the benefit basket, we're with him. But if he walks over to the cross and makes you a basket case... <clears throat> then there's some difficulties going on there. <clears throat> All right, so uh, it would seem greater because the most benefits come to us by means of that event, the resurrection. Also, when one looks at the cross, all he may see is what runs contrary to what would most be desired. When you look, you know, when you're going to apply that to yourself, I'm talking about. When you look at the cross, you go, hmm. You know, and then you look at the resurrection. <clears throat> At the cross is pain, while in the resurrection is joy. The cross is an emblem of suffering and shame, while the resurrection offers peace and comfort. Jesus' ministry seemed successful, powerful, and extraordinary until the cross happened. Okay, so, okay, well, we have to start looking at it. We have to really let that get into us. Okay, <clears throat> That if, if, if we come to the conclusion that the cross messed up, you know, uh, Jesus' successful ministry, his powerful ministry, his extraordinary ministry, <clears throat> then we're going to have to conclude that the cross was a problem. Of course, it just, you know, you can, your, my, our minds, we could have a million different little angles of what we just said there. Um, you know, someone who could go, well, that is a problem, you know, because we're thinking of ourselves and we're thinking. But right there, we're, what we're just stated is in relationship to Jesus. Now, consider the disciples. They're watching this. And they're in the time of all the blessing and the great things happening and all of this. And how did they see the cross initially? Not what was written in, you know, uh, the, the epistles or whatever, or book of Acts. How did they see the cross before they saw the cross? Yeah. yeah. And that cross you can only see by revelation. I mean, you can know he died for your sins. But you're not going to know you died, and you're not going to know all the things that go along with that. So Jesus' resurrection seemed to reverse his misfortunes that the cross had brought into his life. <clears throat> okay. That, is that not sort of a common thought? That the, cross, that the resurrection reversed the misfortune of the cross? I mean, isn't that a common Christian 
sort of a thinking way of thinking and yeah and somebody could say that at any church service or whatever and we'd go yeah you know but that's not in line with what the with the eternal plan of God or with what God did or what with God is doing now <clears throat> but it's so easy to uh, and some of you were in my my first Corinthians class and we really got into the hidden wisdom of God which relates to the cross and we contrasted that, or we didn't actually, uh, Paul did, <clears throat> to the wisdom of this world that um, is proud and uh, wants to be strong and wants to um, <clears throat> demonstrate, you know, in that, and I'm thinking of the first chapter there, wants to demonstrate power in the form of whether it's miracles or, or defeating your enemies. And we went into great length talking about that the Son of God came down here and he, you talk about power, you talk about ability to defeat his enemies, and yet he came down here with the strict purpose to let his enemies defeat him at the cross. You know, I remember the, the picture I painted for you when I was teaching that <clears throat> was this, you know, anybody see a movie... Uh, uh, called uh, the Gladiator. <clears throat> I was in uh, <laughs> I was in Costa Rica, and, and Jeff and Doug wanted to watch it. You remember that, Doug? <clears throat> and Jeff went down and rented it. We're in Costa Rica, and it was I don't know how many times they had reduplicated this thing, but it was the most horrible picture and sound you ever saw. And they'd seen it before, and I'm going, I can't see this thing. I don't know what's going on here. <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> anyway, the very beginning of it, there were these, these uh, hordes of, of just people, you know, I forget the, the name that they were, but, <clears throat> you know, um, heathen, ready to fight these Romans. You know, and they were just, ah, you know, and they were just, you know, all, you know, they were not dressed like the Romans, and the Romans looked good, but these guys were ah, long hair and beards, and yeah, all this kind of stuff. Well, I pictured <clears throat> Jesus coming to this earth to do battle with the enemy, and the enemy is walled like that all the way across as far as you can see, and they're they're on one side of the hill and the, goes down to the valley and here on this side is Jesus and so all of a sudden the enemy goes yeah and they all go yeah and they all start running towards the center of that thing and and down the other side comes this little lamb going you know <laughs> and I'm thinking I wonder who's going to win <clears throat> well Again, Jesus did win, but he didn't win the way we talk about winning. That's the key. That's the key. He did win. But in, instead of expecting and, and instead of God putting everybody else to death, he took that death for him and for us. For us. We're the heathen in that, in that horde, you know. <clears throat> and... Um, well, it is, it, and it's confounding to just the normal Christian way of thinking because it's all, I mean, there's so many songs and everything that is about, let's just go defeat, you know, the enemy, and, ah, and it's like, uh, yeah, you know, let's all take up our cross and follow Jesus, you know. <clears throat> but nonetheless, we're not really ready to get that far into all of this. <clears throat> but, but what per, uh, precipitated us, Addressing this was the last sentence. His resurrection seemed to reverse his misfortunes that the cross had brought into his life. Now, I don't know that we formulate those thoughts in our mind, but I think we agree with them in, for the most part until we hear something different. Uh, <clears throat> But if we don't think that way in relationship to Jesus, we think that way in relationship to us. That the resurrection is going to fix everything. It's going to reverse all of our misfortunes on this earth. So, we're, so, there's, so what am I saying? I'm saying I want, to, 
I want to stir up your pure minds. That's the way I think Peter worded it. I, I could say, I want to shake up your carnal thinking, but, <clears throat> but our brothers from the, that wrote the word are <laughs> a lot more genteel than a, than a few Texans down here. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so my next subtopic is called uh, The Problem and the answer. The problem and the answer. <clears throat> so, I wrote, but is the cross to be considered as the problem while the resurrection is the answer by which we escape the cross? That the resurrection is a final, quick escape from the cross. <clears throat> now, there are people who think that way. <clears throat> there are people in this room who know who you are. <laughs> You're very interesting. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I just looked down and noticed that I, this whole paragraph is questions again. <laughs> and so I'm going to go through the questions. But when I do this, I'm hoping that you'll find you know, you'll look at what you, your answer would be to that. So I'll read that first one again. <clears throat> is the cross to be considered as the problem while the resurrection is the answer by which we escape the cross? Okay. Next question. Is the resurrection the victory God offers us over the trials of life represented by the cross? <clears throat> sure. Is the resurrection the victory God offers us over the trials of life as represented by the cross? Meaning, <clears throat> this is more uh, a psychological angle. Well, you know, the cross really is uh, <clears throat> to us as human beings, the cross represents uh, the great trials of life and Jesus going to the cross, but then being resurrected is showing us that uh, God himself came down here and he showed us the way. And, and uh, when we're going through trials and stuff, there's going to be a great victory. We're, we're going to have a victory on the other side. <clears throat> now, you may have never heard that taught. I don't know that I have, but I bet you there's some people who they're more psychological, you know, <laughs> than, than scriptural. <laughs> Um, okay, is the cross something to be overcome so that something higher might be attained? Now, there's a real common Christian thought. Okay, and I'm throwing these out at you, and, and I'm saying this as, as plainly as I can. I'm not expecting you to agree, agree with me on any of this at this point. <clears throat> I only expect you to please meditate on these things and chew on them because, you know, we're, we're going to get into the discovery of some things that will sort of say it. But I don't want the discovery of certain things I've searched out to say it for you. This is so fundamental to God. Of what is the what is the point? Is the resurrection the point? That <clears throat> I don't. I, if this if there's some truth into this, I don't want anybody walking around ignorant of it. And the only way we're going to do that is either we've never heard it, or we're going to hear it and think we know it. That's it, all ignorance. The other way is. To say, you know what, this challenges me. I mean, I, I you know, uh, Patty was saying something sort of like that while a few minutes ago about liking a challenge and stuff. When I sat out there, I loved to be challenged, man, when I was being taught. When I was in Bible school, challenge me, get, you know. And I would, you know what I would do? Maybe something nobody else does, you know, in this church and Bible school. I'd go home and search it out. I would challenge it back. <laughs> I would be pushed and I'd go, well, wait a minute, the word says, and I cannot tell you how many times, in fact, 
Some of you know that I, man, I would stand up in Bible class or church, and Deb was there. I would go, well, this can't be right because the Bible says this and da-da-da-da. And I'd quote some scripture I knew, which at that time I'd been saved maybe a year. And yet I'm talking to all the elders and leaders and, you know, well, that can't be right. I mean, I know what's right, you know. <clears throat> Only to go back to my dorm room and get into the Word and go, oh, I mean, if it happened once, it must, it, I bet it happened a hundred times. It, I'd be hit with the arrows of the Almighty. And I would just go, oh, oh my God. You know, and he would open my eyes to his view and why that person said what they said. And, and what I learned from that, what I learned from that, because it happened so often and so quick in my first two years of Bible school, I learned not to talk so quick, not to answer, you know what I mean? Not to go, ah, yeah. I learned to go, I'd go, ah, uh, no, no, no. Randy, did you want to say something? Not me, you know, because the Lord, the Lord was faithful and I would challenge things and I would question, but again, see, I mean, we've had people in this Bible school, they'd question all right. They go, well, you're stupid, or this place is wrong, or everybody's, you know, whatever. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. It's not, that wasn't. <clears throat> but, but I think questioning in a right spirit is healthy. It's healthy. We should, we should do that. And I don't mind, I've never minded that in the right spirit that says, I want to know the Lord, so I'm sorry, I'm not going to go along with everything you say. Well, anytime anyone would ever say that to me, I go, go, praise God, good, I don't want you to. This isn't about me, this is about Jesus and, and, and knowing him from his word and by the spirit. <clears throat> All right, so, more questions here. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> or is it a representation that sufferings are to be endured with no remedy until the resurrection? Well, haven't you heard that one? Or sort of, you know, that, well, we're just going to suffer down here, but boy, one day, you know. Um, uh, Deb and I were <clears throat> missionaries in Jamaica for a couple of years, and <clears throat> the Jamaicans had their own style of, worship songs and they had their own songs that they wrote <clears throat> and one of them was see if you can remember it with me i want to go to heaven and rest i'm tired of staying down here i'm tired of my troubles and trials i want to go to heaven and rest <clears throat> Okay, well, now you may be surprised, but there are actually worship songs today that don't sound Jamaican. They sound legit. Oh, oh you just, no. <laughs> and, and as such, we would go, you know, I want to go to hell. You know, however you do that, legit. I, I can't do it. <clears throat> if the Lord gives me a song, I, do, I write it and put it down, but that's it. But if, if, if you could imagine it in the realm of modern day worship, but pretty much said that, you know, well, you know, we're going to go to heaven, we're going to be with the Lord. Hey! Um, okay, now let me make something clear. I got nothing against, going, you know, resurrection and all that. I got nothing against that, you know, the, all of the realities that go along with that. I don't. Um, I could even say that I have been through a series of trials in my life where getting out of here seemed pretty, seemed like a good idea. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, however, the Lord never let me leave the reality that, you know, uh, you're, you know, but for this cause... Are you here? <clears throat> so, uh, so I don't. I, I'm really. I don't want to take off any edge of reality or things like that. I only want us to see all of these things 
in their proper place as God sees it, according to him and his heart. <clears throat> so, in nothing that I share or have shared, am I trying to make fun or take away from something that is yet in the scriptures? Amen? Okay. Just want to make sure. <clears throat> All right. Having asked questions that put the cross in a negative light, now let us ask from another angle. So here goes more questions is what I'm saying. <laughs> I've made an excuse to just keep on asking questions. <clears throat> is the resurrection a remedy or did the cross bring the remedy and the resurrection became the vindication for the cross way of proceeding? And we'll have a whole section on that little last part there this vindication and what that means. <clears throat> Shall I read it again? Yeah. It's kind of a long sentence. Uh, is the resurrection a remedy? Or did the cross bring the remedy and the resurrection became the vindication for the cross way, meaning the true remedy, the cross way of proceeding? I mean, those are, you know, I mean, you can, if nothing else, it, by asking questions like that, it makes you go, okay, well, I need to know what I believe. <laughs> <You know? clears throat> All right. Is the cross the place where we came into oneness and the resurrection the place of manifestation? Okay, well, see, that one, that, that one could be a little tricky because we would say, okay, well, I'm... I'm <clears throat> I'm one with Jesus in resurrection, but the truth is, the truth is, the old, the old man and the resurrection new man, we as the old nature, we, we never went to the cross. We were taken to the cross because Jesus became one with us and took us to the cross. Therefore, ergo, uh, that means that oneness, yes, Lord, get them, show them that it's true. I was really hoping this would come later, but anyways, that oneness took place at the cross. All right. Now, if we didn't think that through, we'd go, it would be real easy to take the information that we have. Well, <clears throat> we were sinners and we were bad, but after the cross, we were joined to Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I'm, 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 I'm trying to get you to think of yours and my theology apart from God's doctrine, God's reality. God's reality is Jesus became one with us and took us to the cross. Um, Romans 6 is great proof. If we have been joined with him in the likeness of his death, we shall. Okay, what is the... What is the uh, requirement and what is the automatic in that verse? The requirement is joined in oneness with him in death. The automatic is we shall. See, it didn't say maybe. It's because that's not a maybe. If there's a true joining in death, you shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. <clears throat> All right. Um. <clears throat> All right, when you scour the New Testament, you discover that over and over, the cross is set forth as the primary event. Now, I don't know that that's necessarily true in modern day theology, but I didn't say modern day. I said when you scour the New Testament, you discover that that's the case. Paul referred to his message as Christ crucified, not as Christ risen. <clears throat> you know. 
Um, and, and that doesn't mean that he will make reference to being risen with Christ. He has to, but that's the automatic. Okay? Um, and I've got a bunch of scriptures here, I, a few scriptures anyway. Galatians 3, 1, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 2. Galatians 3, 1 and 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1 and 2. And then also in 1 Corinthians 1, 17. In 1 Corinthians 1, 17, Paul identifies the gospel as the cross and not as the resurrection. Wait a minute. What does the word gospel mean? Good news. But he, he, he identifies the cross as the good news, not the resurrection. Now, is if, if likeness of death, then likeness of his resurrection. So you, once the death is released, you can't separate it from the resurrection. And I'll explain that here in a minute because they're, they're really, you can't. Right, that's exactly right. And I'm sure they heard you. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's just like with Shay. I mean, we've tried to separate him by putting him back there. <laughs> <clears throat> but you can't stop him. I mean, <laughs> I can stop you right now. <laughs> <laughs> and well, you should, my brother. Well, you should. <clears throat> All right, so Jesus came to be a crucified Messiah. He came to be a crucified Messiah. He didn't come just to be a Messiah with no cross. In other words, now think about it. In other words, then, any reference to the Christ, that's the Greek word for Messiah, Hebrew word. Any reference to the Christ must then be a reference to the cross. Because he came to be a crucified Messiah. He didn't come just to go, hey, I'm God and, and watch me do this miracle and look what I can do here and everything. Okay, I'm going to go away now and uh, remember what I did. Yeah, y'all be good now and utilize my teaching and my... No, he came here to put to death the old nature with everything of it because it would pervert every ounce of it. And if you don't have that death, all you've got's a bunch of Christianized heathen. That's right. <laughs> well, I mean, isn't it true? Because the heath... I'm, refer I'm referring to the heathen nature... I'm referring to Adam, the old man. <clears throat> okay. So, um, <clears throat> so he came to be the Messiah, and the way that he was going to be the Savior was through death. All right. Only in his death could he fulfill what the Scriptures foretold of, his, of him delivering Israel. Only through death. Okay. Um, and then in parentheses, I wrote behind that sin, the world, Satan, all through death. Through death, he, 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 he um, delivered, them, delivered them from him that had the power of, the de of death, that is the devil. Hebrews 2.14. Um, Romans 6, again, dealing with the old nature. Galatians, what is it? Galatians 2.19, dealing with the law. All, I mean, on and on and on. I'm not, I'm not going to try to spell them out. Over and over, your deliverance and your victory came through death. So remember, our, one of our original questions was, how, you know, what is the victory? And God sees the victory at the cross, not at the resurrection. That's... That's, that's huge. But always remember now, 
in, in modern day ways of thinking about this, you can have the resurrection without a death. But in reality, there's no way you can ever have a resurrection without a death. It's not even possible. Modern day theology has made resurrection an entity in itself so that it has its own power. Okay, that being said, therefore you must always remember that when we speak of death, we include the automatic of resurrection. If, then, if buried in the likeness of his death, then he shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Okay, if, then, you see it? If means that's conditional. Then means that's automatic of if being fulfilled. Yeah. See? So it's settled. <clears throat> All right. I don't mean it's settled in your minds. I mean it's settled <laughs> with God when death happens because resurrection will come. <clears throat> um, and, and again, for me, I mean, I've spent a long time. I've spent years meditating on these things years and moving at a snail's pace because my mind would go, okay, wait a minute. Of course, then it pops out all these questions. I'm like, a, my mind is like a popcorn popper, you know, the, well, you throw something weird at me and it, then I go, well, wait about, what about this? And then that and that. But it's good because those questions make you lay it out and make you face stuff that you, you, you know, if you don't ask those questions, then you can have uh, things inside of you that are resisting that teaching or that truth or that fact or whatever, that scripture or whatever, and it can be resisting, but nothing ever gets resolved because you never say, okay, well, what about this? And then the Lord goes, well, right here. You know, the Holy Spirit goes, well, right here. <clears throat> so that's why I say it's healthy. Even to question, I mean, to even to question the Lord. You know, somebody goes, oh, you should never question God. No, you shouldn't tempt God. Big difference. We won't get into that right now. <clears throat> All right, so um, that plan of deliverance was never meant to be understood, talking about the de Jesus as Messiah, the deliverer of Israel. That deliverance or the work of that Messiah was never meant to be understood as political, military, or any other means than by what God had always presented to Israel in the form of sacrifices that delivered them from sin, that delivered them from when they failed on the battlefield and, you know, they'd have to offer a sacrifice and stuff like that. You, you know, like a, I'm trying to think of a couple of spots. One was uh, when... Um, Saul wanted to offer it, and he didn't want to wait on Samuel, but it was in lieu of a battle. And uh, the other one was um, oh, right after they went into the land. Remember the Babylonian garment and all that stuff. And then, you know, to, be, to, to begin to settle things by the cross. And in every example of sacrifice, it's meant to be a picture of Christ. Jesus is the answer, but not Jesus, Jesus. Not Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus, the crucified Messiah. <clears throat> Again, just meditate, you know. Chew on it. Don't swallow it. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so... Um, in, uh, Philippians 2 emphasizes Jesus' death. Not in terms of salvation, but as to what God holds as worthy of resurrection. And we've dealt with that, but I, I, I want to keep, I want to keep that before us. It's not presenting Jesus' death in salvation terms. It's not. Does it doesn't mention doing this for any body and to get any result in Philippians two. It only mentions the depth of his self-giving and the reaction of God. Self-renunciation, however you want to put it. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so, uh, if this is true, then the cross was not simply a phase that one passed through 
in order to reach resurrection. But is the very reason resurrection exists? All right. Um, I'm going to get into this a little more, but I was sharing recently with someone um, about a, the poem that I wrote. Some of you know the, the poem. It's just called Seasons, and it's, a, it's the longest poem you'll ever see almost. <laughs> but, um, and I was just uh, mentioning to them what one of my reasons for writing it was. And I explained to the person that in reality there, are, there is no four seasons <clears throat> that just stand alone. There, there isn't. There aren't, it doesn't, well, there's this, this season or whatever. And in my poem, <clears throat> I ask a lot of questions. And one of the questions was which season came first, and in fact they be, that became sort of the line through this whole long poem. Which season came first? <clears throat> and so we went we went through in that poem. We went through and we examined, you know, summer and winter and fall and all of it. We went through all the spring, and we really, really, you know, saw this and that and the result and everything. <clears throat> but my goal was to show that no, no true season exists without death. Now you say, well, there has to be something alive before it does. Well, let's face it, it's a cycle. I mean, it is. We know that. It's, I don't need to draw that on the board. You, you know that. <clears throat> but, but nonetheless, in the, in the way that God views this thing, and in fact, I'll address that. Let's see. X. Maybe I should quit talking and start reading some more. <clears throat> but I want you to think about this aspect once I start reading this right here. And that is, <clears throat> if resurrection spring comes as a result of death, if it does, then spring does not just appear. There is no season of spring that just, I'm just going to appear. Oh, it's the way the, the, the earth is moving around the, you know, in its axis and, you know, around the sun. So it'll just come, but it won't because there's death that goes into it. And, I, and Jesus gives the scriptures that I'll quote and show you. <clears throat> so if you'll just, just consider these things that, that, it's the same with death and burial and resurrection. We think that they're just three separate things. And again, I think that's probably written right here. But it's, uh, and, and the seasons are just four separate things that just are on their own in their own timing. And so we say to people, well, don't worry. You'll, you know, you'll come out of this into a, into a new season. Well, not if there's not any death. You know, there's not. You know, we wonder why why is my season so long in, in the fall? Well, that's that's Adam right there. <laughs> he spends a lot of time at, in the fall. <clears throat> okay, let me read this. Um, <clears throat> so the subtitle is Resurrection is only a result of death, which we've we've at least stated. Theologically, many see the three subjects of death, burial, and resurrection as separate events, each having its own individual and separate meaning apart from the other. However, <clears throat> this is not true. For, for example, death can stand alone, but resurrection cannot. You see, because I've laid down my life, even if he turned that PA off, I'd still keep going. <laughs> Resurrection cannot happen unless something has died. I mean, just the word resurrection means something coming out of death. It cannot happen. <clears throat> um, there is no reality of resurrection without death. Therefore, there would be, and we, we haven't addressed it yet, but there would be no reality of spring without 
winter without a death. <clears throat> All right, let me, let's keep going. Um, uh, to acknowledge the resurrection is to acknowledge the necessity of death. Death. Death is required in order to have resurrection. All right. <clears throat> in John 12, 24, the scripture says, except, except, unless, except, a corn of wheat and seed fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, springtime. Could you say that? Much fruit, springtime. Okay. So in John 12, 24, the death of the seed is presented by Jesus to be the mother of the resurrection. Unless, except, you see, there it is again. If, then, ex unless this happens, no fruit, no resurrection, no harvest. Lots of sowing, or, or actually no sowing either. And that would, there, there's a little bit better example. I mean, a, a, a farmer goes out to the field and, you know, he's plowed his field and everything, but he hasn't put any seeds in the ground and they haven't fallen in the ground and they haven't died. So he's just standing in a, in a plowed field going, well, you know, uh, springtime ought to be coming up any time now. I mean, I'm really expecting a good harvest this year. You know, in the example I've told you where one time I was talking to a brother about some of these things and, he said, well, you know, when's my ship going to come in? And I said, well, did you ever send one out? You know what I mean? <clears throat> I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, this, there's this, there's this, here's what I'm trying to say. There's this mentality that seasons just change. There's this mentality that just fruit is just going to appear or blessing is just going to appear, that things are just going to happen, that this is, but it's not true, that God has an order. And that when we honor the Lord of the harvest, we see the results of that. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to read that one again because I know I wrote it, but the Holy Spirit gave it to me. In John 12, 24, the death of the seed is presented by Jesus to be the mother of the resurrection. <clears throat> that, that, it, that it is as if resurrection is birthed by death. Except unless it falls into the ground and dies, no harvest. Okay. <clears throat> um, Jesus' words are, if it dies, it brings forth. I mean, can't get any more plain than that. <clears throat> there is no reaping without sowing. And sowing is the death requirement. And I'm, I'm not going to read it, but 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 58 is gloriously informing us of these things. 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 58. <clears throat> um, from these examples, we discern that death and resurrection are two separate things, but one ongoing process. Two separate things in, in how they manifest. Death falls into the ground and dies. Resurrection brings forth fruit. But they're really one ongoing process, which we've, we've stated that already. I mean, that should already be clear. <clears throat> um, but while they are one together, death can exist without the property of resurrection, but resurrection cannot exist at all unless there's been a death. All that comes from that resurrection came, here it comes, all that comes from that resurrection came because there was a death. Remember what, our, you know, is the resurrection the point, remember? Which is more important, death or, re you remember? That's how we started all of this. So we're, so we're following a line here and we're trying to, we're trying to discover, is there a thinking that is uh, different than ours, but it is more in line with the Lord's and, and make, no mistake, I'm not talking about <clears throat> as if my thinking is my thinking is really messed up. That's how come I have to cry out like I do to, to the Lord. <clears throat> um, let me just try to f finish as much as I can here. Because many have not seen the cross as the pinnacle event 
because they haven't seen the cross as the pinnacle of it. They've seen the resurrection as the pinnacle. Of it. Because many have not seen the cross as the pinnacle event. They have lifted the resurrection out of the realm of an event precipitated by and dependent upon something else, which is death, and have viewed it as if it exists all on its own. Thank you. It's just, there's just going to be a resurrection. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> no acknowledgement of God's order or, or, or his heart and the way that he, he proceeds in these things. <clears throat> um, however, remove the cross as a precursor to resurrection and you simply have resurrection as a saving act. Resurre the, the teaching, the preaching, the sharing, resurrection becomes the saving act. You don't even need death. There's going to be a resurrection. That's the saving act. You, at least, can you at least, your mind go, yeah, I, you know, I've sort of thought that at one time, at least once in my life. <clears throat> um, logically then, many might assume that the goal is to save Jesus from the cross instead of the cross being given glory and honor for what it uh, is superior about it. One of the thieves wanted Jesus to save all three of them from the cross. You remember that? If you're the son of God, save us from the cross. <laughs> and then remember Jesus also in John 12, 24, shortly after that, he's praying and he's praying one of those glorious Jesus prayers. Father, what shall I say? Save me from this hour, but for this cross hour, not the resurrection hour. In fact, in fact, Galatians, I mean, John 12, 24, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. The verse right in front of it is, he's about to talk about the cross, John 12, 24, and it says, he says, now is the Son of Man glorified. And he's talking about going to the cross. Okay, so there's, that. now that's important. Remember that, that glory from God's perspective has to do with the cross. Okay, and we're going to deal with that later. Okay, but I, I was juggling what, which should I start with, and I felt the Lord said do this, and then you'll see the glory of it. <clears throat> All right, so um, uh, is, is the resurrection important? Absolutely, certainly it is. <clears throat> but because the death and resurrection are part and parcel together, then to deny the resurrection is to deny the death. Wouldn't it be? I mean, you... Jesus said, well, Galatians again, if you're buried in the, then, okay, you deny the, the then, then you're denying the, the death that brought it about. You're denying the source. It's like people saying, okay, well, I believe in nature or, you know, whatever. You know, I mean, I was thinking about I was thinking about it when I was taking a shower. I know my mind's always going, but I was thinking how the, the soap on my hair, and it was coming down, and, it was, and, and the shower head, it was hitting on my ear, and it was going back behind, and anything that went over here, although there's a little uh, drain thing here, uh, it would slide down this way, or it would hit this, and this sticks out a little more, and it would all move away and not go into my ears automatically, and nature knew that I didn't want water in my ears. I'm just going, no. I <laughs> know, oh, that's weird thinking. All right. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> the resurrection helps us to grasp what God has brought out of death. All right. <clears throat> we'll talk about that more. It is by means of the resurrection through which we are given to discern, get ready. This is important. Because you want to make resurrection important, here's how to make it important. <clears throat> it is by means of the resurrection through which we are given to discern what was resurrected. 
lamb on the throne. Lamb, throne. Resurrection, exalted throne. Lamb. <laughs> you see, out of death, not just lamb, but slain lamb, slaughtered lamb, lamb on the throne. Yes. Right. Where it just, it all comes to realize his death, I mean, the, the cross is not a means to the resurrection, but the resurrection is a result there you go. of the, there you go. the cross. There you go. And, but it, like you said, it cannot be separate. We don't want to separate it, yeah. do we? we? We want, you know. But we, but we want to identify what is most important to God. Can I, can I get amen on any subject? This is just another subject. And in this subject, is, is this correct? And if it's correct, is it, is it really what the way God views things? And if it is, I want to line up with that. I want to live according to that. <clears throat> All right. Um, so um, it is a slaughtered lamb that God has glorified. In the same manner, when Jesus appeared to his disciples, he showed them the nail scars so that there would be no doubt what had been resurrected. The crucified was raised up by God. Look, he says, touch, stick your hand in my side, do whatever you got. It's the crucified one that is now raised before you, glorified. All right. So, um, all right, I got, I got one more little section, a couple of paragraphs, but we can save that for next time. <clears throat> um, again, folks, I just, I'm, this is just, maybe it's no big deal to you all in one sense, I'm sure it is, but on some levels, but, you know, for me, I've just been here for a long time, and um, and this is this is the Lord to me, dealing with me and and molding. I feel I feel like He's molding me, <laughs> you know. And I feel my thoughts being, you know, His thoughts are not my thoughts. I feel that, you know He's taking this old putty, this old clay, and He's He's making it more where I can see his heart and see what's the way that he sees that. And in doing that, I can relate properly to him. And just like, I mean, if that, that song that we sang in Jamaica, you know, I mean, if that's not right, those people love the Lord. You know, I mean, they're born again. You know, those Jamaicans, they, they are. And great people. We love, loved them and still love them. But, <clears throat> um, but if they knew that singing that was so very contrary to what the Lord really wanted to show them, I know a bunch of them would go, oh, my God, I, I would just want the Lord. You know, there's others who go, oh, this is the right doctrine, and everybody believes this, and you're just a weirdo. Line up with the rest of them. <laughs> but but uh, for me, I've spent enough time here that I really, I, I think I've really seen this to be true. And that the cross is the pinnacle and the pivotal uh, event in the heart of God, which he exalts to the highest throne. That's Philippians 2, <laughs> 5 through 9, or 11. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, um, you have graciously <clears throat> worked against this hard clay and, and kept, kept on me and with me. And thank you, Lord. <clears throat> and I pray you'll continue to open my eyes and my heart to you, the Holy Spirit, that you'll remove all hard sticks and rocks and stuff that's in this clay and make me more moldable. 
I pray for your people, Lord, whether on Skype or in this place or that will listen to this later or watch the video, that you'll just open their heart, that you'll soften their hearts too. And uh, Lord, not that, not that they should accept everything I'm saying is right, but that they should be more open and say, Lord, if this is true, then show me. So Father, we, we humbly seek your face and seek the face of your son. We ask you to help us not to form our patterns as if this is only a classroom for a course on a planet somewhere. This is a place for hungry hearts that love your son. And I know you want him glorified. Help us, help us to do that by knowing him correctly so that we can relate correctly in oneness with him. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that's it. We're not going to stay around, but it sounds like maybe the storm and the rain already just went through. First round, First round yeah.